Halo. Ya. Started. Ya. Good evening, everyone. Hello. Ma'am, you are listening to me? Yeah. Yeah, I can listen. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, yeah. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to today's uh, session of uh, uh, the 40th session of our webinars meeting, which we are conducting. Uh, today, we have a very important topic, which we get in our clinical practice day and day, day in, day out. And uh, we have a speaker uh, who will be uh, speaking on it. Uh, we have uh, uh, senior members as our panelists today, Dr. Seema Sune, Madam from Amravati, and Dr. Rashmi Mundra, Madam from uh, Nagpur. I hand over the proceedings to Dr. Rashmi, Madam. She will introduce the topic as well as our speaker. And then uh, we'll proceed with our uh, talk today. Over to you, Rashmi, ma'am. OK. Thanks, Yogesh. Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Lockdown 4 webinar sessions. Uh, today, we have a topic, benign breast disease, uh, evidence-based management. We all know that benign breast disease include a vast majority of benign pathological alterations of the breast. And they involve right from non-proliferative breast diseases to proliferative breast diseases and uh, with RTPR or without RTPR and also a lot of other conditions. So this is a very broad topic, though we come across these cases many times in our and sometimes it causes us a surgical dilemma also whether we are supposed to operate, not operate. So I would uh, like Dr. Siddharth Dubashi uh, to uh, present his uh, presentation and give us a uh, light on this topic. Also, uh, we all know that Dr. Siddharth Bhubashi is professor and head of Department of Surgery, AIMS Nagpur. His associate being there, he has he's done his MBBS MS from BJ Medical College, Pune. Uh, I think I'll give the over, switch over to him and ask him to continue the topic. Yeah, uh, thank Dr. you. Siddharth Dubashi. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I thank the office bearers of uh, the Association of Surgeons of Nagpur and the Vidarbha Surgical Loc uh, Association. Actually, this is my first official interaction with all these uh, esteemed members. So, all the senior uh, members of the association, uh, my colleagues, and dearest of all the postgraduate students, uh, here is the presentation on the management of uh, benign breast diseases. The title suggests management, but then uh, seeing the spectrum of diseases and certain basic concepts which need to be elaborated, I cannot jump upon the management directly. So I have uh, tried to touch upon few interesting uh, clinical aspects as well as the pathology aspects of each and every benign breast disease. Also, I have included certain uh, cases which I have encountered, which have been rare variants of common benign breast diseases. So all this has been included in the presentation to try to make it more comprehensive. Uh, if you see the structure of the breast, it's a complex tree-like structure comprising 5 to 10 primary milk ducts that originate at the nipple, 20 to 40 segmental ducts, and then you have got 10 to 100 sub-segmental ducts that end in glandular units, what we call the complex as a terminal duct lobular unit. And we need to know that the benign breast changes are more common in women of the childbearing age, and we see a peak between the ages of 30 and 50 years. To explain the concept of benign breast diseases, what we need to understand is the concept of ANDI, which is called as the aberrations of normal development and involution. Now, this concept was put forth in 1987, this paper, a uh, landmark paper in Lancet by Lux et al. on ANDI, which is a new perspective that time on the pathogenesis and nomenclature of benign breast disorders. So what did they say that it includes a variety of benign breast diseases. It occurs at different periods of reproductive periods in females and can be placed within the overall framework of pathogenesis. All the different perspective, all the different aberrations that we're going to see fall in these three stages. You have stage of globular development. you have got a different cyclical changes under hormonal influence and finally the involution. To give examples, when you talk of the early reproductive phase, if you talk of the normal development of a lobule or the stroma within the breast, the aberrations would reflect in the form of formation of a fibroadenoma lesion or a juvenile hypertrophy. 
If you talk of the disease pattern, you may have a variant of this fibroadenoma itself, which would be a giant fibroadenoma, or you may get multiple fibroadenomas in clinical presentation. Similarly, we talk of a mature reproductive phase. If we have to look into the normal cyclical changes that would occur, which are under you know, hormonal influence, you may have hyperstimulation effects, or you may see a disease pattern in the form of nostalgia with nodular changes. When you talk of the involution phase, again, with reference to the lobular and ductal components, you may have an aberration of sclerosing adenosis or more common ductectasia or in the form of epithelial hyperplasia without any atypical changes. And then you may have disease patterns later on in the form of the fibrocystic changes along with formation of lump due to periductal mastitis or you may have atypia rooted on the epithelial hyperplastic component. So these are the three phases and how you progress from a normal structure to aberration and frank disease patterns. This is as per the Hughes et al. concept of ND put forth in the landmark Lancet paper of 1987. So this presentation will include all these, a comprehensive presentation, just see the exhaustive list, we'll talk of nostalgia, we'll talk of mastitis, breast abscess, fibroadenoma, fibrocystic disease, phyloids tumor, ductectasia, duct papilloma, galactosine, some other rare variants like pseudoangiomatous stromal hyperplasia, though incidence is much less, but we do, do encounter such lesions, radial scar, complex sclerosing lesion, traumatic fat necrosis, we are going to talk of a desmoid type of a lesion, the congenital abnormalities like polythalia, polymasia, gynecomastia, and now much more in vogue, that is the diabetic mastopathy. So all these would come under benign breast disorders. If you have to classify them as per the symptoms, we need to understand there are three main symptoms with reference to benign breast disorders. There will be pain in the breast, or you have a palpable mass, or you will have a nipple discharge. If you talk of just pain, which are the common clinical conditions where the pain would be a clinical presenting feature? If you have cysts, you may have fibrocystic disease of the breast, or you can have a mastitis. When you talk of a palpable mass as a presenting feature, common lesion, yes, would be a fibroadenoma. You may have fibrocystic changes. You may have cysts. You may have a patch like syndrome, or you may have a phyllodes lesion. If you have a nipple discharge as a presenting feature, you may have ductectasia. You have intraductal papilloma or you can have a galactoria. The nature of the nipple discharge would vary in all of them. In interactive papilloma, you may have a blackish or a red color uh, nipple discharge. A ductectasia would give you a greenish or a serous nipple discharge. This is another classification if you see based on the histopathological examination. And why this classification is also to be known, because if you see the patterns, this reflects on the relative risk of breast cancer. And as we progress from a non-proliferative pattern to a proliferative with atypia, naturally, the relative risk of breast cancer would increase. If you talk of the incidence of non-proliferative lesions, these are the commonest to the tune of around 65%. We have proliferative lesions without atypia to the tune of 30% and rest 5% falling into this proliferative pattern with atypia, where the relative risk of breast cancer is quite significant. The fibrocystic changes, a fibroadenoma type of a lesion, a phyllodes tumor, the various forms of mastitis fall in the non-proliferative pattern. The radial scar, a complex sclerosing lesion, an intraductal papillomatous lesion fall in a proliferative pattern but without atypia. And in proliferative with atypia noted, you will have the atypical ductal component or atypical lobular component showing the corresponding hyperplastic changes. Whenever we talk of management of benign breast disorders, this triad will always go hand in hand. We have the surgeon, we have the pathologist, and we have the radiologist. They need to work in harmony. We'll talk of an approach to a patient with a benign breast disease. History, clinical exists is not just to enumerate the list, but it's extremely important to obtain relevant history and do a proper clinical examination of both the breasts a mammosonography, 
cord needle biopsy fnac cord needle biopsy the gold standard role of mri in diagnosis is not well established in literature it is still not forming the first line of investigations in any of the disorders we'll see later on i have one slide of mri role of mri in benign breast disease again we'll discuss on that subsequently questions would come up in discussion and yes role of ductography especially in cases of say intraductal papilloma what i meant by saying that a proper history and a clinical examination we need to identify the risk factors for breast cancer because ultimately why we are interested in management of benign disorders it's not just about whether we are talking of conservative approach with subsequent surveillance what are we doing the surveillance for increase in size of lesion the lesions getting more suspicious ultimately we are just worried about one thing and that is a malignant change so first itself in history itself we need to identify the risk factors because some of the management protocols for some of the conditions could change based on presence or absence of risk factors for breast malignancy characterize the symptoms the group of symptoms for each of them physical examination and this will not be complete without examination of the costochondral junction and the lateral chest wall these itself will give you too many clues especially when we talk of mastalgias so mastalgia another term a mastodynia can be a cyclical pattern or a non cyclical pattern but here we need to remember that we need to rule out chest pain of extra mammary origin as well in the examination history why this is of concern because of the impairment in quality of life in these patients in around 30 to 40% cases quite significant and hormonal cause is implicated in most of the cases and age here more than 40 years plus any of the risk factors which are there in that particular patient with reference to breast malignancy plus clinical findings significant clinical findings warrant a further evaluation with a mammogram sonography when we talk of a cyclical mastalgia we have a conservative type of approach with proper fitting garments intermittent analgesia or graded exercises the various drugs which have been implicated in the management of mastalgia include so bromocriptin which would have a proactin lowering effect a tamoxifen which is having an anti estrogen effect danazol interfering with the fsh and dlh levels and the age old primrose oil which would have the components of the linoleic and linoleic acid which would help in correction of the abnormal prostaglandin synthesis but now the recent literature definitely has conflicting reports on use of primrose oil what i found in most of the literature recent literature is use of bromocriptin danazol and the last of it came as tamoxifen we we'll talk of non cyclical mastalgia talking of the mammary causes as well as the extra mammary causes do not forget this group because we need to identify the cause then only the treatment protocol would be successful we we'll talk of the mammary it can be traumatic fat necrosis it can be a focal mastitis type of a lesion patient can present with a lump because of a peritoneal mastitis or it can be a thrombophlebitis giving a wonder city type of picture from official from the levitis all these would have wonder's disease traumatic fat necrosis would have a conservative type of approach extra mammary tick syndrome or radicular radiculopathy the diffuse chest wall pain would be dealt with oral or topical NSAIDs and reassurance is required in most of these cases of non cyclical mastalgia when we talk of a mastitis look at the spectrum an acute mastitis we also have a chronic mastitis manifesting as antibioma in few cases and need not ignore this entity of tuberculous mastitis in our country acute mastitis a lactational type of mastitis initially you will have frank cellulitis the cellulitic stage followed by development of a frank breast abscess and here is the point where we intervene we keep a close watch at this particular stage of cellulitis definitely interfere intervening here at breast abscess here if we do not intervene we have lot of complications to follow and the most fulminant of all would be necrotizing fasciitis of the breast i myself see a three cases of uh, necrotizing fasciitis of the breast we'll discuss the subject in the next slide so expression of the milk oil fed to baby use of antibiotics and abscess drainage the radial incision or inframammary incision we do not drain the abscess but 
just administer antibiotics. We see a fibrotic change within the abscess cavity that becomes more firm as a breast lump. Subsequently, you may be having to excise that particular region, which is called as the antibioma. There are certain WHO criteria which are being put forth for diagnosis of puerperal mastitis, and that is nostalgia, the local redness, the warmth, the breast swelling, which is usually unilateral, fever, generalized body ache, and general feeling of malaise and illness. So this was put forth by the WHO in 2000. They have also given the, the criteria for bacterial culture of the milk, uncontrolled symptoms after 48 hours of antibiotics, recurrent puerperal mastitis, patients of puerperal mastitis requiring hospitalization, these patients would be subjected to bacterial uh, cultures for the milk for deciding the antibiotic protocols. We had a case of a 48-year-old female patient presenting surgical OPD with a lump in the right breast involving the upper and lower outer quadrants, which are extending into the axilla with evidence of skin ulceration. Now, as per the history which was narrated by the patient, the lump had been present since past four months. Skin involvement was evident since one week. The ulceration was seen since one week as per history of the patient. Right breast lump was tender, diffuse, irregular, overlying skin edema was present, but no clinical evidence of axillary lymphadenopathy, no history of fever. However, patient did mention of significant weight loss, which was quite evident clinically also. All hematological investigations and chest X-ray were normal. Discharge from the lesion of the site of ulceration was subjected to head and staining, culture for acidophas bacilli that also proved negative for the same. FNAC reported an acute inflammatory exudate. Now, seeing the clinical picture, the lump was excised and the histopathological examination revealed typical granulomatous lesion and the Langhans giant cells. We have administered the antitubercular treatment. Patient has been asymptomatic during a follow-up of two years. Now, this is the lesion that we had in that particular uh, male patient. You see this. Now, looking at this uh, lesion, first thing, of course, what comes to you is the stage four uh, malignant type of a lesion. But that was not so. But seeing the condition of the patient and uh, the subsequent investigations, which all were negative for various uh, pathologies that we thought of, so excision biopsy was the only alternative which proved to be a tuberculous lesion. So tuberculous mastitis, one to four percent incidence. You have a hard lump. There would be multiple abscesses, sinuses, matted nodes. Maybe the presentation not seen in our case. Usually secondary to pulmonary lesion. Here the chest X-ray was normal. Pathologically, different types of tuberculous mastitis would be evident like nodular, sclerosing, or a disseminated type. So FNAC or core biopsy remains the option for the diagnosis. ATT, lump excision, lump excision under cover of ATT. When you talk of breast abscess, uh, the classification that is invoked is a purpural breast abscess or you have a non-purpural breast abscess. Purpural, as the name suggests, it is in the lactation rates to the lactational period. It is a complication of the mastitis. The non-purpural ones can be central and peripheral. An interesting association of smoking is found in association with the central type of the uh, breast abscesses. Common complication of a periductal type of a mastitis, periductal mastitis is the actually the pathology that you see in case of ectasias. Now you can have a recurrence here, which is quite commonly seen in central type of abscesses. Recurrence with fistula formation is extremely common with the central variant of the non-pupural breast abscesses that is called as the Duska disease. And here the options available are the percutaneous drainage and antibiotic cover. When you talk of the peripheral type of the lesions, peripheral type of non puerperal breast abscesses, now these are characteristically seen in conditions like patients having diabetes or rheumatoid arthritis, use of steroids, immunocompromised states, recent interventions in the form of, say, the patients may be uh, in the, uh, they may have received radiotherapy or received chemotherapy recently for some other surgery in the breast, but they respond well to drainage and antibiotics. The chances of recurrence noted is quite low with these patients of peripheral non peripheral breast abscesses. What we need to understand is the importance of image guided drainage breast abscesses using a large bore needles. 
yes there is a role for placement of indwelling catheters for larger collections more than 3 cm diameter collections yes there is a role for placement of indwelling catheters saline lavage of abscess cavity will also be beneficial there are conflicting reports uh, regarding the local installation of antibiotics you may may not there have not have been any significant difference in the outcomes that's why this question mark here regarding the local installation of antibiotics we also need to understand at this stage where uh, we need to have an open drainage uh, in relation to the failure of treatment what would you define as failure of treatment would be the four to five attempts of ultrasound guided drainage so these are the various issues that in relation to the treatment of breast abscess i'll repeat the image guided drainage preferable large bore needle indwelling catheters preferable for larger collections saline lavage of abscess cavity is definitely going to be beneficial we may or may not instill uh, antibiotics locally into into the uh, abscess cavity the outcomes uh, in the various uh, reports in the meta analysis the various series have not shown any statistically significant difference and at this stage to define a failure of treatment with image guided uh, drainage would be four to five attempts here is another case where in a 41 year old lady presented to the surgical emergency with pain and swelling in the left breast since 4 days 4 days history pain swelling left breast abrupt onset no clear predisposing factor or etiology on examination patient febrile tachycardia locally evidence of diffuse erythema marked tenderness subcutaneous crepitus edema associated with skin mottling but no axillary lymphadenopathy investigations patient is anemic leukocytosis yes elevated c reactive protein levels hyponatremia blood sugar levels normal chest x ray insignificant fnc of course revealed frank pus here we had no option but to make a primary diagnosis of necrotizing fasciitis of breast you we'll ask why this was made by this definition of why not simple breast abscess i'll show you the picture and then we'll decide why this diagnosis of necrotizing fasciitis was made parenteral antibiotics including metronidazole were started patient taken up for emergency surgical debridement we had drainage of around 70 cc of purulent fluid and all necrotic breast tissue they had to be excised culture showed a polymicrobial infection with isolates of staph streptococcus proteus and klebsiella species this was the clinical picture look at this uh, classical picture of necrotizing fasciitis and it is extremely important to identify this clinical picture in the early stage of necrotizing fasciitis itself early stage itself we need we may need to have repeated debridements but initial debridement is of utmost importance because all the unhealthy tissue will have to be removed and in fact based on all the laboratory investigations like the hemoglobin levels the lactate levels the uh, sodium levels the uh, presence of the uh, elevated c reactive protein levels what we can have actually is the laboratory risk indicator score for diagnosis of necrotizing fasciitis called as relenac score which was uh, proposed in 2004 by gong et al so that score had been applied in this particular uh, patient and this score ranges from say 3 to 13 so any score more than 7 warrants a surgical intervention at the earliest here the score was coming to 8 so this patient warranted immediate surgical uh, drainage the outcome was definitely good because we got the anaerobic culture reports also subsequently and the antibiotics were uh, the uh, modified according to the culture reports Uh, necrotizing fasciitis also can be of various types here the commonest one is the polymicrobial type or type 1 type of necrotizing fasciitis you may also have type 2 which is a monovic microbial type of infection quite rare and type 3 is even more rare it is a clostridial type of necrotizing fasciitis here fortunately we had a type 1 type of microbial uh, necrotizing fasciitis of the breast per se if you see necrotizing fasciitis of breast
can hear. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So now you can hear. Yeah. So you one slide back, sir. One slide back. Yeah. One slide back. back. Yes, yes. I'll go back to the previous slide. When you talk of the focal yeah. lesions, we're talking of the age group, whether 35 years or younger or more than 35 years. 35 years or younger, we're talking of the vague nodularity or the thickening of the breast tissue which is there. These patients will be subjected to re-examinations at uh, intervals and various imaging modalities. But more than 35 years, here's the role of a mammography, mandatory mammography, which is there in addition to the sonography. In case of postmenopausal women, we need to have a surgical consultation after the mammography that is there, that is mandatory. When you talk of the common nodular regions, the commonest one is a fibroadenoma that comes to our mind and which we encounter also. So it's the most common benign tumor of the breast, uh, seen in the age group of 15 to 35 years of age. You may have hard and soft fibroadenomas, so palpable masses up to 3 cm. Classically, we call them as breast mouse because of the extreme mobility within the breast tissue. And uh, the hard variety is actually microscopically a pericanalicular type of variety. The soft one is an intracanalicular type of variety. You may also have lesions more than 5 cm when they have been termed as giant fibrodenomas. You may have other components making it a complex. The investigation modalities for this subsequently the imaging ones, the mammosonography. Sonography would show you well circumcised hypoechoic focal masses which would displace the surrounding parenchyma. Or you may have a well circumscribed mass on a mammography plate with or without popcorn like calcifications that you see. What are the indications for a percutaneous uh, biopsy and inconclusive sonography? Evidence of tendency to grow, a new palpable mass in a menopausal patient, a firm mass or a lump, and presence of risk factors, again here test taking, and suspect microcalcifications on mammography. The histological picture would show a stromal proliferation with slit-like compressed epithelial components. That's the classical picture of a fibroadenoma type of a lesion. So, small lesions, less than 3 cm, single lesions, age less than 30 years. Recommendation is follow-up at 6 monthly interval and sonography scans. Where would you intervene surgically? Size more than 3 cm, multiple type of lesions, giant type of fibroadenomas, recurrence and those who want cosmesis. Surgically, these can be dealt with with a submammary incision or a periareolar incision. And other ones which are mentioned in literature, many, many invasive, with reference to high intensity focused ultrasound or a cryotherapy and vacuum assisted excision. So I myself do not have an experience in relation to the minimally invasive uh, approaches for a fibroadenoma. But what is given in literature is the relation to the high intensity focused ultrasound, the mechanism being a protein denaturation and coagulation necrosis. They claim to have reduction in lesion size and treatment time, and volume reduction can be increased with second treatment. So it's quite clear that you require two sessions at least for effective management by a high intensity focused ultrasound for fibrodenoma. This can come up for discussion subsequently, those who have experience with TIP2 for fibrodenoma. Regarding cryotherapy for fibroadenoma, which gives a hyperechoic effect obtained with ice ball formation. Just a second. Sir, just a second. Just a second. Now go ahead, sir. Now go ahead. Yeah, they can see now? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. So the cryotherapy for fibroadenoma and hyperechoic effect obtained with ice ball formation. So again, you're going to have the protein denaturation mechanism. Easily identified therapy can be directed with precision towards so the, direct, so the target directed therapy as they call it when we talk of cryotherapy or a vacuum assisted excision with the 8 gauge or 11 gauge large bore needles but success rates are seen in lesions only less than 2 cm in size so what I found from literature is the case selection becomes extremely important if you want to try these minimally invasive type of uh, therapies for fibroadenoma or then our eight old surgical methods for large fibroadenomas having a billiard thomas or the inframammary incision and for the smaller ones, they can be dealt with the periolar uh, incisions right over the parodenoma lesion that would suffice. Here is another interesting case that I came across in uh, practice that is a fibroadenoma in ectopic breast tissue. So we need to remember about the ectopic breast tissue as well. So if we talk of the develop this, when we talk of ectopic breast tissue, we need to talk of the mammary lines, the milk lines, the embryonic, uh, the development of the breast as such. So the mammary ridges. The ectodermal breast tissue, so axillary breast tissue is a variant of ectopic breast tissue with a 6 to 20% incidence. 
actually it's two to six percent incidence. We had an 18 year old girl with a painless, mobile, firm left axillary lump since two years. And there was an increase in size since one year. And our initial diagnosis, I must admit, was an axillary lipoma. We had a surgical excision of that particular region, but histopathology showed a fibroadenomatous change in ectopic breast tissue. So when you talk of a differential diagnosis of an axillary swelling, we need to keep this thing in mind, an axillary breast tissue. And any axillary breast tissue, an ectopic breast tissue also is vulnerable for all the routine cyclical changes that are seen in normal breast tissue that needs to be kept in mind. When you talk of the fibrocystic disease, now again, whether to use this term as a fibrocystic disease or fibrocystic disease with the nodularity that also comes under the average normal development and evolution with reference to mastalgia changes. So proliferative and non-proliferative changes with the evidence of cellular ATPI in some painful palpable lumps. There will be predominance of estrogen stimulation and relative progesterone deficiency. There would be cyst-like lesions, fluid field widenings of the terminal duct lobular units lined with a single layer of epithelium and on ultrasonography you will find that there are well circumscribed lesions oval to round anechoic or hypoechoic foci these would be other terminologies which we see in literature or they are used sometimes interchangeably but again with a word of caution we need to understand what is this blood good cyst a blue dome cyst of blood good last cyst often contain brown fluid which impart a blue color onto the intact cyst let me be frank we no longer actually when you talk of in clinical practice we do not use these terminologies actually it is aberrations of normal development evolution we talk of fibrocystic changes or we talk of nostalgia or mastodynia these are the terms used but still some may be uh, we talk of the examinations or some of the postgraduates or attending these again refer to a fibrocystic disease. When you talk of blood dome, blue dome cyst of blood code, we are talking of fibrocystic disease of the breast. Histologically lined by flattened columnar epithelium with apocrine cell features, or they may completely lack an epithelial lining. To make it further complicated, 1892, the term was used as cyst adenoma breast. You may find in literature the terminology called as Schimmelbusch disease. So when you're talking of Schimmelbusch disease, we're talking of a reckless disease. We're talking of a terminology called as a mesoplasia described by Cheetel and Cutler. All these way back, that was the way back in 1892, all these terminologies along with blue dome cyst of blood gold, all are referring to fibrocystic changes. So there should not be any confusion and support. It is the term that is used now in clinical practice is fibrocystic disease of the breast. Word about atypical ductal hyperplasia and atypical lobular hyperplasia. Why we need to have this particular thing on a different slide. Localized intraductal proliferation having some but not all microscopic features of low grade ductal carcinoma in C2. So these lesions are not to be, these patterns are not to be taken lightly. Moreover, look at this finding in this uh, uh, paper by Elliot Al. About 10 to 20 percent cases who were diagnosed as a typical ductal hyperplasia on a core needle biopsy were upgraded to ductal carcinoma in situ on subsequent excision. So here we need to again have a history, history uh, correlation, clinical examination correlation, subsequent uh, the uh, serial uh, examinations and may land up with excision biopsy. The excision biopsy report will also have to be correlated with the initial CNB report. Look here, quite significant, about 10 to 20 percent cases of atypical ductal hyperplasia upgraded to ductal carcinoma in C2 on subsequent excision. Upgraded means actually clinically these are the downgrading that you see in these patients. Clinical downgrading has occurred. Atypical lobular hyperplasia distinction with lobular carcinoma in C2. Now this is based on the parameters like degree to which the involved lobules are distended and the architecture has got a defaced pattern. So word of caution about a typical ductal hyperplasia and a typical lobular hyperplasia. When you talk of the different parameters, now again, this terminology also is not frequently used nowadays. We are again referring to fibrocystic changes with mastalgia. That's how we say that. When we were students, this was a common term used that is fibroadenosis. Now it is fibrocystic disease, fibrocystic changes with mastalgia. Fibroadenoma, yes. So the nature of the lesion, here it is actually the aberration of normal changes in the breast. A fibroadenoma is a benign tumor of a lobule. 
pain is more marked with fibrocystic changes pain is usually absent in the fibroadenoma type of lesions the fibrocystic changes in mastalgia would be seen bilaterally here it's a unilateral presentation fibroadenoma uh, lump would be irregular ill defined in case of fibrocystic changes with mastalgia whereas in case of the fibroadenoma type of lesions you will have well defined lesions firm lesions mobile lesions we will not have nipple discharge per se in a fibroadenoma but in fibrocystic changes we have a serious type of discharge or a greenish type of nipple discharge which will be evident an entity called the phyllodes tumor <laughs> these are of the fibroepithelial tumors with epithelial and cellular stromal components now these have a unique predilection to attain large size they are forming less than 1% of all breast neoplasms classically you will see them huge lesions the overlying skin would be stretched there would be evidence of dilated veins moreover on palpation they would reflect a fossilated surface microscopically that's the characteristic uh, pattern that you see a branching pattern in fact that's the leaf like pattern that's where the name phyllodes with a fibrous stromal proliferative component surprisingly with this type of picture you may think that it is a highly a malignant type of a picture but there is no skin or muscle fixity no lymphadenopathy no nipple retraction but the who has classified them as benign lesion borderline lesion and malignant lesion and what we recommend is the wide excision with at least 1 cm margin the traditional class criteria that is the azubardi and the salvadori criteria for diagnosis of nature of pilot tumor extremely important you will see i have put an asterisk mark here for the fifth criteria because the original criteria classification the criteria put forth this framework did not have this this fifth component has been added by who later what was proposed in initially in 79 and 89 by the party and solidarity the criteria were tumor margins the stromal cellularity the mitotic rate the pleomorphism that is evident now when you talk about tumor margins in malignancy you will have infiltrative ones with a high stromal cellularity more than 10 mitotic figures per hypopil and the severe or the marked pleomorphism that is seen along with stromal atypia so this is the characteristic picture of a malignant pyloid tumor these entities mind well do exist though the incidence would be around 16 20% but these entities do exist because i myself have encountered such a case in recent uh, years we had a 58 year old lady presented with a right sided ulcerated breast lump since 8 days now this history of presence of lump in right breast was present since 3 years and the skin ulceration has progressed rapidly over 8 days with a rapid increase in size in lump since two previous two months now this is another very very characteristic feature of a phyloid type of lesion malignancy of a phyloid type of lesion this you see a biphasic pattern which you see on history so again history taking is extremely important associated with pain foul smelling discharge no history of any other lumps or no significant family history in this patient left breast normal and 5 by 5 cm ulcerated region of right breast hard consistency Uh, lump was mobile no evidence of axillary lymphadenopathy a uh, coronal biopsy reported a malignant neoplasm so we took it as a malignancy as we routinely say with distinct pleomorphism areas of necrosis uh, there was no evidence of any distinct meds so patient underwent a formal uh, radical mastectomy but a histopathology examination reported a malignant phyllod type of lesion so there were evidence of increased mitotic figures focal necrotic patches epithelial lined cystic spaces with hypercellular stroma which claimed the diagnosis surgical margins were clear with no nodes these parameters do stand again important routinely also they are because they would decide if further course of adjuvant adjuvant therapy that is required whether it's chemo or radio we talk of the uh, surgical margins positive surgical margins but with reference to malignant phyloids also these are extremely important surprisingly there is no role of uh, the which is clearly mentioned whether it is hormonal or when we talk of the adjuvant therapy as say whether it's chemotherapy or radiotherapy when we talk of a malignant phyloid type of lesion now look at this picture this had just given way around 3 to 4 days back before the patient presented so this was a full specimen excise and this were the characteristic sheets of stromal proliferation with atypia which you see characteristically in a malignant phyloid type of a lesion 
what i recommend in literature is a close surveillance of this patient of course this patient anyway refused for any further investigations or uh, further follow up we have asked this patient to follow up but in literature also they have not specified any clear role of adjuvant therapy for a malignant pyeloid type of a lesion but remember these uh, malignant pyeloid tumor in more than 25 to 30% of the cases are liable for recurrence in case of positive surgical margins as well as for distant metastasis to either lungs or bones another common benign breast uh, lesion pattern is ataxia now these patients also are going to present with hard or firm lumps in practice what is the pathology here is a primary dilatation of one or the lactiferous duct now this dilatation is going to lead to the stasis of that particular content and prolonged stasis at one particular location of the duct is going to damage the ductal epithelium and this ductal ductal epithelium will further cause alteration of ductal permeability because of which all this content would come out into the periductal tissues elicit a very fulminant local reaction causing periductal mastitis and this is responsible for the hard lump so we need to understand at this stage why this duct ectasia would present as a firm or a hard mass now it is also called as plasma cell mastitis because of the microscopic uh, picture that you see uh, with the lymphocytic infiltration these patients are going to present with nipple discharge a serous or a greenish type of a nipple discharge and untreated cases would form localized an abscess or they may have the fistula formations so we are going to have the lump excision the duct excision and under antibiotic cover in case of a duct papilloma type of a lesion here now these lesions i am talking of are the ones which are presenting with nipple discharge you must have understand now we are moving from that spectrum of those which are going to present with palpable lumps some of those palpable lumps may be along with the nipple discharge but per se if you talk of nipple discharge as a complaint one was duct ectasia now i am talking of duct papilloma so here a larger lactiferous duct is affected but these patients are presenting with sub areolar lumps there would be a reddish nipple discharge or a black colored altered uh, blood nipple discharge the treatment here would be a removal of a wedge of breast tissue to a depth of 4 to 5 cm we remove a single duct the affected duct is being removed with a microtrochectomy type of an operation or you are not able to identify a single lesion but two or three ducts getting affected in a defined area where you have a cone excision or radial excision of the ducts which will be called as a hadfield operation a galactosil a secondary subareolar retention cyst dates back to the lactational period there is blockage of the lactiferous duct due to the epithelial debris there would be calcification of the collections and uh, fnsc would uh, give the diagnosis but we need to excise these particular uh, lumps mammography per se we need to understand has a low sensitivity as an investigation modality low sensitivity to nipple discharge only around 20 to 25% you may see some calcifications an excel calcification or rod shaped calcifications which would be evident in case of periductal mastitis ultrasonography has got a 56% sensitivity for detection of a ductal carcinoma in situ when you talk of duct ectasia the duct caliber would be reflected was more than 3 mm uh, size a doppler ultrasound would help in differentiating between duct producing viscous secretions and an intraductal nodule increased chances of malignancy what are the factors age more than 50 years a nodule more than 1 cm and a nodule more than 3 cm from the nipple so evidence suggest as these factors which would reflect increased chances of malignancy age size of the nodule and the distance of the nodule from the nipple areola complex MRI use of MRI as an investigation modality for these type of lesions again we have a grade C recommendation when would you use it when mammography is normal it may help you to have an assessment of the location and extent of the lesion but the moment you again have suspicious lesions here again we go back and have a second look ultrasound so again we are here if you see the various papers which are there it is not about MRI clinching on to the diagnosis mammography initial report normal now we are advocating mri for diagnosis it may give a suspicious lesion again again we are going back to have a second look usg mri a grade c recommendation when you talk of the diagnostic armamentarium for benign breast disorders 
going to a little rarer varieties pseudo angiomatous stromal hyperplasia patch as a benign breast lesion it is actually a proliferative mesenchymal lesion with a possible hormonal etiology again it may be present as a palpable mass or it may be detected on screening it's a well defined firm rubbery mass microscopically you are seeing a dense collagen a fibroblast proliferation forming distinctive slit like spaces resembling blood vessels in the stroma between the terminal lobular units now here there is a role for the immunohistochemistry there will be spindle cells they will be positive for vimentin or cd34 ihc patterns ultrasonography would give well defined hypoechoic lesions but we need to have excision with clear markings a radial scar and a complex sclerosing lesion uncommon but dangerous lesion an imaging manifestation of an idiopathic scarring process that is unrelated to trauma or surgery here we need to understand if that lesion that you see if the stellate type of anidus is more than 1 cm it is called as a complex sclerosing lesion csl it's a tumor like lesion it contains a stellate anidus a star shaped anidus of dense elastic collagen associated with entrapped epithelial component or proliferative lesions like sclerosing adenosis to complicate the picture surgical excision becomes mandatory when you have this type of imaging diagnosis of a radial scar when we talk of traumatic fat necrosis which also again which would mimic a malignant type of a lesion it is actually a benign non superative inflammatory process of the adipose tissue around 2.5% of all breast lesions result of trauma to the breast may there may be available history of trauma to the breast or breast or you may have seat belt injuries a history of a cyst aspiration or a biopsy or some interventions on that particular uh, breast uh, pathology or breast uh, uh, parenchyma tissue initially hemorrhage subsequent induration subsequent you may have cystic degeneration a hard lump nipple retraction may be evident mammography here you will have coarse calcifications micro calcifications again add to the confusion or you may have spicules again which may mimic a malignant uh, changes that you see on a mammographic plate so you have to be extremely careful have a high index of suspicion in these particular patients again correlate with the history if available ultrasonography would give you solid hypoechoic masses with posterior acoustic shadowing mri again a lipid cyst or round of oval mass excision biopsy recommended a mammary fibromatosis or what we usually see in case of abdominal wall desmoid type of lesions similar type of lesions may be seen in the breast to extremely rare but again we need to identify these lesions these entities do exist we had a, a literature review with the case report in 2017 that was the latest one which i found 0.2% of all breast tumors 4% 4% of all extra abdominal desmoid lesions interestingly bilateral in 4% cases now here the origin may be from the fibroblast or the myofibroblast within the breast parenchyma or interestingly from the pectoralis muscular aponeurotic layer this is the origin of this particular benign lesion it would present as a firm mass with skin dimpling nipple retraction here again the role for immunohistochemistry positive for b catenin IHC pattern recommendation advocated is a wide local excision, but here again chances of recurrence here in various series which are reported up to 29-30% chances of recurrence. Similar as we have so despite patterns with the abdomen, similarly the same pattern follows here in the breast tissue as well. It does exist, hence we should know. Wide excision is wide local excision is the treatment recommended. So these are some of the cases which I have uh, encountered in uh, practice. That is the polythelia, supernumerary nipples along the embryonic milk lines. Now here the frequency ranges from 0.2% to 5%. Characteristic association with other dermatoglyphics or the other uh, dermal patterns. So under the banner of genodermatosis, you may have uh, cases of familial polythelia or familial uh, polymasia. So either you have uh, supernumerary nipples or supernumerary breasts. We have also talked of the ectopic breast tissue. So all again related to the uh, development, those milk, embryonic milk lines, those mammary ectodermal ridges. Yes. Another uh, case that we deal with uh, routinely is 
gynecomastia again some of the cases that we have encountered so it's a benign enlargement of male breast tissue and what you have is a more than two centimeter palpable firm subareolar gland and ductal tissue which is evident here both gland as well as ductal tissue what we call it is a classically a disc lesion like lump a smooth surface but a smooth surface do not forget to examine the gonads microscopically there are different types which have been uh, described florid or a fibrous or an intermediate variety treatment is a subcutaneous uh, mastectomy so this disc would be removed be careful not to have a complete flattening in relation to the ripple areola complex closure of this particular incision is also of utmost importance which has to give the proper cosmetic look because patient is coming to you for cosmesis we need to again send him back with a reasonable good job grading of gynecomastia as proposed by simon et al in 1973 this is the uh, grading that is routinely used there are two or three more given in the textbook but what at least the simon's grading is the one which is commonly recommended a grade one wherein you have a small enlargement without redundancy of the skin you may have a 2a type of a pattern that is a moderate enlargement and again there is no skin redundancy the moment you get skin redundancy the lesion falls into 2b pattern with a moderate enlargement and the moment you have a breast mimicking a female breast with little bit of ptosis so there's a marked enlargement with lot of redundancy it is a grade three type of a gynecomastia to add to the confusion yes diabetic mastopathy so diabetes has not uh, left the breast also less than one percent of benign breast lesions but again these do exist with patients with long-standing insulin dependent diabetes mellitus it is actually a secondary autoimmune reaction to the abnormal extracellular matrix accumulation which is arising from the effects of hyperglycemia on connective tissue so it is the effect of hyperglycemia on connective tissue component on the stromal component that of the breast so here the patient mind well will present as palpable multiple but painless painless breast lumps it is a self limiting fibro inflammatory breast disease it's a firm resistance which you get on performing the FNAC. Uh, I don't know how many residents nowadays themselves, we as residents, did perform a final aspiration cytology, which itself has a very unique technique. Uh, there's a firm resistance while performing an FNAC. Little different from that you get while doing an FNAC, say from a fibrodenoma or a fibroadenosis type of lesions. Microscopically, you have lymphocytic infiltrations or epithelial fibroblasts. But here, look here. Here the treatment recommendations are different surgical biopsy better avoided here you may have a flaring up of the lesion 60 percent of the lesion tend to be bilateral recur after the surgical excision so here we talk of a diabetic mastopathy here so you need to have a, a good person a trained person performing the needle aspiration it's a self-limiting fibroinflammatory breast disease it's all again about glycemic control microscopically if you have this particular pattern along with history of a long-standing insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus. Uh, keep this one differential in mind of a diabetic mastopathy. Yes, so here now we... Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, I think I closed at the right time. Yeah. Right time, right time. That's what I was <laughs> yes. yeah, Seema, ma'am, please unmute your mic. Seema, madam, please unmute your mic. Seema. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Yes, ma'am. Hello. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, Hello. I can hear you. Yes, yes. Yeah. First of all, thank you very much, sir. You practically covered each and every point that should be covered. Literally given details on each and everything. Thank you very much. Thank I you. would just like to know if you could give us some idea regarding postmenopausal galactoria. Post menopausal uh, galactoria. Galactoria. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Here the treatment recommendation again would uh, reflect on to use of uh, tamoxifen. Again, open for uh, discussion. Uh, first, we'll have to uh, find out the reason for galactoria. Has to be investigated. Yes. The yeah, uh, first, normally uh, the, the other we... aspect regarding the thyroid, the thyroid profile, the prolactin profile. Prolactin profile yes. and. Many times you have pituitary microadenomas. Which yes, so the, yeah, the, so the evaluation of the pituitary uh, thalamogonadal axis. So that is uh, something which need to be evaluated with the thyroid thyroxine levels and the prolactin levels. Okay. 
Now, does MRI brain help over here? Again, if you want to talk of the, the pituitary adenomas, if you want to rule out here, this MRI of the brain would naturally would be the brain imaging would play a role in this. Uh, many times Thank you. Very ask a history seema the patient gives a history of recent onset headache also many times yes so that becomes a one thing where we say ct scan is required or mri brain is required if there are means prolactin limits yes what i've already seen is that many a times even the hcg levels even they are raised during this mm. So that has also been seen. Hypothyroidism is one of the causes, which also leads to yes. that. Once corrected, many a times the galactoria automatically starts getting reduced. Yes, yes. So you had said regarding lactational mastitis, we go ahead with aspirations, right? Hello, yes, am I audible? Yes, yes. yes, say again. For lactational mastitis. Yes. So yes. We go ahead with aspirations and we try around four to five times for that. And supposing we fail, then we go ahead with radical incision, right? No, I said in case of a formation of a breast abscess. So yeah. the lactational mastitis would be seen actually in three stages, wherein you have a cellulitic stage initially, there we do not intervene as such. The antibiotic cover is there, keep a close watch. Once the abscess formation is there, then we go in for an image guided drainage. That's what I said. Yes. Right. After drainage, what about the discharge? Like the galact again, because we have already given an incision, the galactoria is yes. now how yes. we do deal with it. The discharge, though, the duct will have to be sutured. Okay. Yes. Do we always find the duct after draining the abscess? We may or may not, but then otherwise, then it's a drug therapy. That, but they do advocate regarding the use of nylon sutures for closure of the duct. Right. Thank you very much, sir. Yogesh, anything other questions from someone? Uh, Ma'am, there are a lot many questions from audience. Uh, I'd uh, take them one by one. I request audience, please stick to one question per person because we already have uh, crossed nine o'clock and uh, we must give chance to each and every person to ask a question. Uh, before that, I'll just uh, give one announcement because as soon as the question is done, people leave. Their uh, question is answered, they tend to leave. We have around 65 people online, so I just make an announcement. We are having uh, 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 next sessions. We have already posted in the group whatever the sessions we are having next. Uh, 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 there is a one week plan for pancreatitis. Uh, I have posted the form uh, two or three times in our group. Many of you have re uh, responded to that. If you haven't, please respond to it again. I'll post that form again in the group tonight. Okay, we will take question one by one. Dr. Vikram Desai, sir, first, please unmute your mic. Hello. Hello, yes. Yeah, am I audible? Yes, yes. Yeah, excellent presentation on benign breast lesions. Congratulations yes. for that. Uh, oh, I have you. a small comment and a query. Uh, okay. In cases of cystosarcoma phyllidis, most of the yes. patients turn up with recurrence. So recently yes. I had a patient, I mean a year back, operated twice elsewhere for cystosarcoma phyllidis, came back with recurrence, was fed up, a lady in her late 30s. So I suggested a simple mastectomy and if at all she was willing, an augmentation mammoplasty. So we did a simple uh, mastectomy and a latissimus dorsi flap. And uh, about a year now, she is more than happy. No recurrence up till now, touch wood. So I think if there are recurrences and if the childbearing and all is complete, a better option is do a simple mastectomy and maybe add an augmentation procedure. What is your take yes, on that? Uh, definitely, literature does does recommend. Uh, literature does give recommendations uh, with reference to simple mastectomy. Right. Yeah. Uh, uh, augmentation query, uh, that is left to the patient. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. And my query is in a case of duct ectasia where there is yes. a nipple discharge. Uh, what is the best way of finding the duct intraoperatively? Because sometimes it can be difficult. So how do you go about it? You have an infant feeding tube or you have an ethylon suture which can be put into that particular, if you see that on surface, if you see that particular thing, you can cannulate that and put methylene fluid ion. Okay. 
yeah that would actually help you to even in fact have the single duct for the macrodermectomy but usually most of the cases of duct is that lump will have to be excised so it actually comes to a own excision it comes to a head kill type of operation but use of methylene yeah, blue would facilitate agree. yeah use of methylene blue yeah. would facilitate the excision yeah definitely if there is a small lump then it becomes easy your job is easy but if absence yes. of a lump and a single duct sometimes yes yes yes, 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 yes. we do and talk to that use of methylene blue would do the red pull okay yeah thank you so much yes, thank you thank yeah. you sir thank you sir i'll give chance to residents today now subhashri page subhashri please unmute your mic Subhashri, please oh. unmute your mic and ask Hello. a question. Yeah. Hello. Good evening, sir. Yes. Uh, yes. My doubt is, uh, could you please throw light upon management of ALH and ADH, sir? The atypical lobular hyperplasia and atypical yes. ductal hyperplasia. Yes, that's yes, what sir. I told you. Yeah. When the moment you get uh, these uh, cases of the atypia pattern, these would be mm. further subjected to excision biopsy and subsequently. They have to be correlated with the coronal biopsy. If the coronal biopsy, as we already told you, 10 to 20 percent of the lesions can be upgraded. Upgraded micro microscopically means they are clinically downgrading lesions. So subsequent serial ultrasound scans and the imaging with mammography becomes mandatory in these particular cases. Surveillance is extremely important, whether it is a typical ductal hyperplasia or a typical lobular hyperplasia. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Rahate sir now. Rahate sir, please ask your question. Rahate sir. Uh, he has typed a question here. I'll just read that. Uh, any role of steroids in benign breast diseases? Role of steroids in uh, benign breast uh, diseases? Uh, I did not find uh, much uh, literature on role of uh, steroids in any of the uh, benign breast diseases. And one more question, any role of anticox empirical treatment in non-healing chronic mastitis wound, histopathologically non-tubercular? Histopathologically non-tubercular. Uh, there are reports uh, who have used empirical, see in our country, empirical therapy has worked. Uh, there have not been any grade one or uh, recommendations regarding use of empirical therapy like that. Usually when we have an excision of the lesions, we do find some granulomatous, we do find Langan's uh, giant cells in the lesion. If you talk of scientific evidence, there is no grade one recommendation of use of empirical therapy. But of the record, empirical therapy does work in these patients. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Next. Dr. Yeah, sorry, yes, sir. Uh, listen to Dr. Uh, voice. Yeah, we could uh, listen to him. Sir, any more question you have? Uh, question, sir. It, it was very nice, uh, Dr. Dubba. She joined uh, Vidarbha Surgical Society. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank my you. first official interaction with you all in this lockdown. <laughs> yeah. So now we'll go to one more resident. Uh, uh, yes. I guess I don't know whether they, these are resident. Aparna Bhatt. Please ask your question, Aparna Bhatt. Because she's not here. I will go to senior member. Mapari, sir. Hello. Hello. Yeah, yes. hello. Yeah. Uh, this is Dr. Aparna, but can you hear me? Yes, yes I can yeah, hear you, madam. madam. I have a question. I have a 39-year-old woman who had a two-month history of a, a not too painful lump. And on a, a ultrasound, it showed small areas of abscess and the inflammatory uh, what is that? Uh, branching patterns seen and uh, mm. FNAC uh, abscess. And uh, mm. uh, uh, while doing an IND and biopsy, the histopathology said idiopathic granulomatous uh, mastitis. So, how mm. do we? How do you treat this? And uh, uh, what is the course? Or how does the disease progress? Actually, yes, it's a uh, very extremely rare. Uh, thing. In fact, this now again correlates to uh, the previous question asked by Rahate sir. Role of steroids in any of the benign breast diseases. Now, this was one which pattern which I did not cover in my presentation. That is idiopathic granulomatous mastitis. If at all, if at all, to stretch out and indicate uh, use of steroid in any of the benign breast disease, this is one entity where you may attempt use of steroids. Okay. 
What about uh, Kappa Colin or any of these uh, prolactin inhibitors? Do they help? They have, they, they have tried, but uh, if you talk of the higher levels of recommendation, is it is with reference to steroids in only this form of benign breast disease, idiopathic granulomatous mastitis. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Aparna. Yeah, we have Dr. Mapari, sir, from Akola. Mapari, sir, yes. please unmute yourself. Yes. Good evening. Nice yes. presentation, Siddharth, sir. Good evening, sir. Good evening, sir. Good evening, sir. Sir, uh, patients with the retracted nipple, many yes. times we are not able to cannulate the duct itself. And uh, by conin technique, also, we take out the that much of the segment of the uh, duct along with the cavity of the uh, abscess cavity. But still, yes. patient comes with the recurrence. And they, they have got the retracted nipple one thing second question is uh, multiple small fibroid moths in the both breast is there any medical management these are multiple small multiple so yeah both the file take one by one now the first one that you talked of a retracted nipple i understand little bit of scarring issue which is there but uh, you need for cannulation you just try to actually uh, take a small artery forceps first initially to make that particular opening wider or use uh, the ethylon suture a stiff ethylon suture try to make an attempt with that if not we go in for that particular bone excision but here in these cases we have to be extra particular on the table to go a little beyond that particular fibrous mass otherwise you are getting that recurrence you are losing out some of the affected tissue you are keeping it back so either you attempt to make that particular opening with a stiff suture or with a pointed artery forceps you will achieve that particular cannulation or if you are not able to do that go a little beyond that particular scope of that particular lesion i think the recurrence rate will be much less the second one regarding the multiple fibroadenomas within one breast tissue here again the recommendations are again if the patient if you see the age of the patient less than 30 years these are going to be kept under surveillance they are not going to cause much of the disturbance to the patient but if the larger ones they can be removed most of the time, we are not able to even negotiate with the uh, this thing, uh, fine mosquito forceps also. Then, yeah, I understand that. I understand then, that. Then you have to go in for a wider excision. Wide excision. We are not able to see the opening also to just to cannulate this, any stiff uh, material, uh, th thread material. You need, to ex you need to express it firmly. You see that discharge coming out. You may not be able to cannulate, but you see the discharge coming out to that particular area. Delineate that area, that entire area will have to be sacrificed. And what about the rest of the retracted nipple? What to be done? That will have to be. Uh, that will stay that back. Is the most most common cause for the recurrence, retracted nipple itself. If you remove one of one of the stigma, that will not uh, prevent further recurrence. No, if the, what I have seen is that the thickest article, if you go a little beyond that particular area of that indurated tissue mass, excising into the people try to conserve tissue. And here's the problem that is the cause for recurrence. Here we'll have to be a little radical where you're not able to identify the duct, you will have to sacrifice a little more tissue than required. Even after removing the adequate amount of the uh, part of the nipple, also patient uh, keeps on coming to the uh, hospital for the recurrence of the abscess itself recurrence of the abscess then i'm sure that initial pathology has not been tackled if there is recurrence of the abscess uh, usually we send the <laughs> send it for the histopathology <laughs> uh, is there any is there remedy for the retracted nipple itself no i have not dealt with uh, that type of uh, issue Sir, one more question about retracted nipple we have in the question answers by Dr. Rate, sir. A retracted yes. nipple in young female, what is the management and what age should be surgery? Uh, what age surgery should be done if needed? A retracted nipple in young female. My other question uh, was like that. What is the surgery? <laughs> for the yes, if anybody, I have not much experience about the management of a retracted nipple. If anybody else has got a comment to make on this particular retracted nipple. Any of the other panelists? Yeah, any panelist or any member, if they have any uh, uh, comment on that, please type it here so that I can uh, unmute your mic. Uh, next question by Dr. Johara Khan. Till that time, we'll take a question. Dr. Johara Khan, please unmute yes. your mic. Yes, sir. Good evening. Yes. Hello, am I audible? Yes, yes. Hello. I can hear you. Yes, I can hear you. 
sir i have a question about antibioma you said we yes. use antibiotics for uh, without drainage of abscess cavity how much time it takes uh, it takes to form an antibioma it is not there is no fixed uh, time as such uh, say, i don't not say that we give antibiotics just like that in fact if there is a moment you have a breast abscess formation there the antibiotics are not going to work wherever there is abscess we need to drain it that's point number 1 point number 2 in case okay. antibioma has formed that means you have given at least uh, two weeks to three weeks of antibiotic administration has already been there okay okay sir in which cases we prefer we prefer to this antibiotic antibioma therapy hello thank you no antibiotic therapy no 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 that's the wrong message perhaps came from the presentation it's not antibiotic therapy antibioma is a lesion it's a form of a chronic mastitis type of a lesion seen because of an improper management of acute mastitis okay okay sir there is no antibioma therapy in fact we have to deal with an antibioma as a hard lump okay thank sir. you dr telkar sir ravindra sir please unmute your mic hello Yes, yeah, Ravindra. Uh, Dr. Dubash, excellent presentation on so many bin and bread diseases. You have explained. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Also, I have two queries. One, the most yes, commonly question by a mother who underwent instant drainage of the breast abscess, that uh, yes. can I feed my baby from that breast? And second one is a young female patient, eighteen to twenty years old, having multiple bilateral fibroadenomas with recurrence, second time, third time. Uh, how will you manage this patient? Yes, the first thing is that um, after the incision, see from the opposite breast, the breastfeeding will still continue. From the yes, side where same, you have, same from breast, the side where breast. the drainage, yeah, from side where the drainage has occurred, initially for the initial three to four days, at least express the milk, boil the milk, and feed it to the patient. After three or four yes. days, breastfeeding can start. Yes, Thank you. And regarding Thank you, regarding multiple bilateral fibroadenomas in young female patient. Regarding multiple recurrent bilateral fibromas, that would depend on the size and the cosmesis. Sir, the, More than uh, three centimeter size, patient wants cosmesis. We'll have to go in for that particular excision. Sizes ranging from two centimeter to eight centimeter, eight to ten fibromas oh, no, on both. Two to eight centimeters definitely. This is an indication for a surgical uh, excision. Right. If it was less than two centimeter, I would have again there 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 is the role then for the high intensity focused ultrasound. Less than two centimeter lesions, success rates are to the tune of around sixty to seventy five percent with if you if you type of modality. I had a young patient, eighteen year old female, having bilateral eight to ten fibroadenomas, size ranging from two okay, centimeter to eight centimeter. Okay, All sir. the fibroadenomas again she developed recurrence in six months only. Again, few of the fibroadenomas okay. they were more than two to three centimeter size, and then she was put on uh, Novex uh, evening primer oil. After six okay. months, she started some improvement in the reduction in the size of the fibroid, and it disappeared then. This primrose oil and all those would give only a symptomatic relief. A close surveillance would still be required. She may come with a more chronic type of lesion subsequently. Yeah, but more but than, it more worked. than three centimeter, more than three centimeter. Yes, it did work in your patient. More than three centimeter uh-huh. lesions, surgical excision uh, recommended. Hey, I wanted to ask any some any other some hormonal treatment for such type of patients. Uh, no level one recommendations regarding hormonal type of treatment for uh, thank you ravindra sir thank, thank you sir thank, thank you. you thank you so dr aparna bhat has a uh, comment on that uh, retracted nipple thing which we were discussing dr yes, aparna ma'am hello yeah uh, the thing is uh, for retracted nipple usually there is a fibrotic or a tethering area so if it is yes. just one side yes. which is pulling it probably uh, Uh, doing a local uh, excision of that fibrotic band or that that can give some kind of relief but if it is circumferential uh, 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 retracted nipple then you need a plastic surgical procedure usually they put uh, incisions on two small incisions on either side they cut off all the fibrotic ducts yes it cannot be done in nally paris or those who have not completed their family so that kind of procedure surgical procedure usually will be required but if it is a very uh, small band or a small uh, single duct probably sacrificing that duct will not really affect the uh, lactation per se thank you madam yeah thank we you. have dr uh, yogesh sabu sir he has a question please ask yogesh sir sabu sir please ask your question unmute yourself 
Yeah, Yogesh sir, I can see your mic going green. Please ask your question, sir. Yeah, uh -huh. please go ahead. Yeah, Dr. Duvashi. Yes, sir. Ah, yeah, Dr. Sabu, sir. Yoga Sabu. Yeah, good evening, sir. Very nice yeah. presentation. I just wanted to know whether is the role of uh, tablet Savista in cases of fibronomas, recurrent fibronoma or very small fibronomas. There are few people who are advising tablet Savista, steroid pill. Yeah, see, this, uh, they are there. These things are there. They may work in one patient, two patient. Frankly speaking, I went through literature extensively. I did not find any convincing reports or level one recommendations uh, type of papers on these uh -huh. medications. So it's these do I... work in sporadic cases, but uh, I did not find any convincing literature on these. Because I used in few of the patients and I got a results. But the exactly. patients who are not ready for a exactly. surgery, exactly. yeah. Exactly, exactly. Even I have, if you have to talk of personal experiences, even I have used it, even I found the results. But uh, see, this was being an academic presentation. Uh, evidence yeah, yeah. does not uh, give anything yeah, yeah. Uh, pertaining to this. That's why. Yes, I agree, I agree, I agree. Yeah, yeah, uh, how, does yeah. it, how much does those you use in just such patients? Those of the tablets, Savista? Yeah, Dr. Dubashi, sir. Hello, Dr. Dubashi? Dubashi, sir. Yes. How much the dose you are using and for how much time? Just one tablet. One tablet uh, alternate day or bi-weekly? No, alternate day. Okay. What I have used is alternate day. Alternate, right, that's I am also using alternate day. Okay, yes. thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Sir, we have yeah, ma'am, please. Sir, yeah, I have used tanazole. Sir, I have used tanazole also. Uh, uh -huh. in some patients specifically after 35 years, it has got effect but generally uh, a mild reduction in size rather than a disappearance i would say yes okay, okay. Uh, people, yes there are uh, this is again you talk of dinosaur somebody would again tomocryptin as well so these are having uh, these sporadic case reports are but it is not true sir but sometimes when patient is not willing and if fnac is negative for everything and proves that it is fibroadenoma i have used that yes okay 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 thank you we have important comment and a small question from Dr. Rahate, sir, again. Sir, you are unmuted. Please put your comment, sir, and ask your question also. This is the last question we'll be having now. Rahate, sir. Uh, role of vitamin E, role of tamoxifen. <laughs> uh, yes, yes. Role of vitamin E and tamoxifen, when you talk of the cyclical nostalgia, definitely this has a role. But if you talk of the, again, I'll talk of level one recommendations. The sequence which has been mentioned is the damazol, the bromocryptin. Last of all comes tamoxifen. Even nowadays, as per the recent reports, uh, they have advocated stoppage of the evening primrose oil. Though it has got the essential fatty acids of linoleic, linoleic acid, still it has come into disrepute for some cause or the other. So the sequence is bromocryptin, danazol, and then tamoxifen. Again, with periodic surveillance and the other sonographic scans, pelvic scans that would be required. Vitamin E, yes, tablet Avion does work. We ourselves have used it left and right. But again, there are no randomized control trials as such. But cyclical nostalgia being so common modality, and we have used tablet Avion, it does make a difference, especially with patients with fibrocystic changes with nostalgia. Yeah, thank you. One just small comment regarding the galactoria in postmenopausal women. Uh, okay. We should ask a history of uh, taking ppi domperidone is the biggest cause of galactoria okay okay okay, okay. yes sir yes sir. yeah thank so you. we have yeah, thank you, even few most of the antipsychotic drugs also cause yes yes yeah i need to make the conclude, i need to make the concluding remarks so just give me an indication when the question is over so there is one slide of concluding yeah. remarks yeah dr sukhdev adhikari dr sukhdev adhikari please ask your question if you are available, he is not there. I guess he is not attentive. Okay, so we have finished all the questions, sir. Okay, uh, so final the comment from you and then the final answer from our uh, panelist. Yeah. Yes. So to conclude, uh, history taking it is an art. This is not just a philosophical sentence which I have put here. If you see through all the uh, the clinical presentation and treatment protocols or the various questions that we see, history taking really is extremely important in these patients with benign breast disorders. Clinical examination should aim to identify those features that distinguish malignant from benign lumps. Mammography can detect occult lesions. UGC and the fine needle aspiration cytology, FNAC, if done in the correct manner. 
would help to differentiate solid cystic lesions. Poor needle biopsy can be image guided, definitely can exclude or establish malignancy. MRI is not a routine diagnostic procedure. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Yeah, yeah Rashmi, how do, you find, how do you find this group? Hello, yeah, Subhashi, sir. Subhashi, sir. Oh, this is lovely. Oh, this is lovely. This is this is that's what I said. This was my though I have many friends here, I have interacted with them on a personal basis. I've met them at conferences at, at Massacon at Amaravati after I joined uh, uh, Nagpur last year. But uh, yeah. this is my first official interaction with the entire uh, association, with the society, very vibrant. And I must congratulate Dr. Yogesh Pang and his other team, uh, which is there to make these things happen. Uh, this quality work which is going on with the Association of Surgeons of Nagpur. And again, once again, I thank the senior members of the association, all the office bearers to give me this opportunity to interact with you. Definitely, I'll participate more and more. I hope to see you in person as soon as possible. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Rashmi ma'am and Seema ma'am. If you have any last comments, uh, please uh, go ahead and then we'll uh, close off the session for today. Uh, it was a very nice presentation. All the topics you, were Madam. covered very well. Uh, only one thing I wanted to add was uh, granulomatous mastitis, though we call it tuberculosis or this thing, but here in us, Nagpur and Vidar region, we get a lot of cases here. Of okay, this okay. Type. Which is okay, a surgical okay. dilemma because many of them come to you after being IND has been done and the wound yes, is not yes. yes. That is the reason why it is very difficult to treat and most of the time you get these cases where you have to okay, follow them okay. up seriously. And uh, I have started many of them on uh, empirical tubercular uh, anti-TB treatment and most of yes. them have responded. So yeah, that's, that's what I said. In India, it does, India, it does work. Yeah, yeah. Mm. In India, it does. I don't know whether it is because of the antibiotic or the streptomycin which is having the effect on that, yes. or it is really anti TB which is working. But yes. I have got patient series which have got work on that. Thank so you, that thank you. For the because it is uh, a surgeon operates in the periphery and then the patient comes to you again that the wound has not healed. So it's that is yes, a yes. very difficult case to treat. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Sita. Dr. Thank you, Seema, thank you. Also very, and yes, all the uh, 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 this thing, colleagues and everyone who have come for this session. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so, so much. Thank you. Uh, it was one thank of the. Thank you very super. much. Yeah, Seema, ma'am. Yeah, go ahead. I, no, I was just saying that it was a really wonderful lecture, and we really enjoyed a lot. Met to Rashmi, ma'am, also. You. And I just have to say one thing. I do want to second this opinion about of Rashmi, ma'am. Many a times we do get cases where and the wounds are not healing and they really respond to antibiotics. Even the low dose, they start responding and the wound heals. What exactly it is, whether it is the Ma'am, your mic got mute. Seema, ma'am, your mic got mute by mistake. Yeah. What I wanted to say was that I do second Rashmi ma'am's experience, even I have experienced that in my practice, that many a times patients whose wounds are not healing, not only the breast, other wounds also, you put them on anti even on the low dose, and they start responding very beautifully. So somehow, even if you don't get a granule, if you get not a specific one, but still many a times if the pathologist says it is granulomatous and the start of anti gives wonderful results. Thank yes. you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for the comment. Thank you for the comment. Thank you very much, ma'am, uh, Seema, ma'am, Rashmi, ma'am, and uh, Dubashi, sir. Thank you for that excellent Thank talk. Thank you. Loved it. So I'll exit and uh, end the session today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much Thank for the opportunity. Thank you. 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 Thank you.